Um, yeah, I've uh, had a curious journey from the, the world of grocery through to, um, through to social games, and uh, I'm going to take you through really a kind of pragmatic view of, of what sort of things in those areas over the last uh, sort of quite a few years have, have worked um, in, in terms of uh, really understanding and predicting customers and, and then obviously taking action against that. Um, just to sort of uh, introduce the two businesses, uh, superficially they're very, very different. Um, uh, you know, Clio Cardo is delivering groceries, real physical goods to people's houses, um, and it's, uh, uh, it's uh, you know, doing a very good job of that and is widely acknowledged as having the best customer service um, and has uh, been expanding over the last year to, uh, to build a second huge automated warehouse up near Birmingham. Um, and the, the one existing warehouse up near Hatfield is, is responsible basically every day for, for packing about 1.3, 1.4 million items into customers' orders and delivering them. Um, and uh, and Ocado was one of the first businesses to really shift across from just purely being on the web to having uh, iPhone and iPad apps, um, which was a, a, a very sort of prescient move and uh, has turned out very well for them. Um, and, uh, and King is, uh, is obviously quite a different sort of company. Uh, it's, uh, it's the second largest casual social gaming company on Facebook um, and has recently started branching out into mobile games as well and, and tablet, which is obviously a, a very large future ahead. Um, there's about a billion monthly game plays. Uh, these are on games uh, of the sorts that have kind of hundreds of levels of the kind of Angry Birds type variety. Angry Birds is not a king game, but it's that kind of thing to just familiarize yourselves with the concept. Um, and uh, these games do show tremendous loyalty. Uh, there's 40 million plus monthly unique users are playing uh, King's games. Um, and, uh, and King has a sort of slightly unique uh, approach to the business in terms of developing the new games to try and avoid the, the problems of, uh, of the sort of traditional games industry where it's very hit driven, rather like the movie and other similar entertainment industries. Uh, and again, uh, King is, is, is fully across uh, web, phone, tablet. Uh, which is uh, a sort of very important part of the business. So these two businesses look very, very different, but I'm actually going to take you through uh, some, some examples in, in, in both of them to illustrate uh, uh, how, how tackling the, the different kinds of customers in the right way was tremendously beneficial, um, and, uh, and how, in fact, there's quite a lot of similarities in, in approach and, and also in, in what one learns, uh, even through due to these two very, very different businesses. Um, so this, this sort of roughly covers, uh, I think, what I've learned. Um, so, uh, and I'll, I'll illustrate this with some practical examples in a moment. So really, customer prediction and customer segmentation are 80, 90% uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, it's, it's a bit pointless trying to predict future customer behavior without understanding the different customer types that you've got. Um, and, and segmenting customers is, is not much use unless those segments have a certain predictive value to them that you're then going to act upon. So I've, I've found that in almost all cases, segmentation and prediction are things that you need to consider hand in hand. Um, and uh, and it's, it's no great surprise, but there are many, many different types of customer, and you really need to understand them. And I'll show you some really uh, sort of clear-cut examples of, of what can happen when you do understand those customers. Um, uh, and I'll also try and explain a bit about, uh, about how easy or difficult some of these things are. It's certainly true that in, in some parts of this sort of predictive and analysis, customer segmentation type area, um, that, yeah, you need a few guys with PhDs in maths and statistics to do some fantastic algorithmic work. But equally, it's true that there's vast benefits to be had from doing really, really simple stuff as well. Um, and so you need, to, you need to try and sort of develop a bit of an intuitive feel for the landscape to understand uh, what, the, what simple stuff can give you big benefits before worrying too much about huge complexity. And I'll, I'll try and cover that when I uh, uh, go through the examples. Um, and uh, certainly what I've seen almost across the board is that you know, personalizing almost every aspect of the customer journey and the customer communication uh, has shown uh, you know, a great deal of value. Obviously, you need to try and prioritize amongst those things, uh, and that's often a very hard task. Um, and then the last point here, I think, is, is just sort of essential and, and is often missed by once people get, their, get sort of down in the weeds and stuck into trying to sort of predict and, and segment and analyze customers. Um, and it's that... Uh, uh, you know, prediction is, is no use unless you're going to take an action. And, and almost the, the, the sort of typical, very common 
horrible example of this is, is when uh, people try and predict customer retention or customer churn. And, and very, very often I've come across uh, that, that, that um, there's a, you know, you can, it's very easy to predict after the fact that a customer's churned. You know, you can predict, oh, last week was the last time that they're going to shop with us. And that's just way too late. You know, all you can really do at that point is send them yet more emails. And you know, emails is just, a, just an awful channel to communicate with your customer. Um, and so you know, all of these things, you, you want to be predicting uh, in, at a time frame that is useful for taking the kind of actions that are meaningful for what you're trying to predict. And in the case of predicting churn, uh, the time scale that's by far and away the most useful is being able to predict that when they are, uh, when they are actually on your site. Um, so it's, you've got to be understanding that at, at that moment in time. So let me take you through some examples now. Um, so uh, this is uh, an example from Ocado's website uh, of the, the search engine. So obviously, uh, well, it may not be obvious, but uh, most of Ocado's customers uh, search for a good 50% of what they buy. Uh, so there's all sorts of other facilities that have been created there to, to allow you to create personalized lists, to uh, recommend you stuff that you, that, of what you would typically buy, and here's your typical shop, and all those things are great, and they all help, and some customers use them a lot. And Ocado, it turned out, could predict the accuracy of some of the average customer's next shop uh, at about a 63% accuracy in terms of the items they'd buy. Um, so clearly, if you can put those items in front of someone, that's a massive time saver. Um, uh, but on top of that, all customers spend quite a lot of time in Ocado's search engine. Um, and searching for groceries is a very different thing uh, to, uh, to you know, searching on Google. There's a limited catalog of somewhere between 20,000 and 40,000 items. Um, and, uh, and customers want to be able to compare and contrast. So they, well, they want the, the return list to be organized in a way that is meaningful in terms of the, the, you know, putting brands together or similar size products together. Um, um, and also, they want to, the most, obviously, the most person items to be first. And that's very hard to know. Um, so when customers search for milk, which almost everyone does, no one searches for semi-skimmed milk or whole milk or whatever. Uh, everyone just searches for milk, and they expect their favorite brand of milk to be amongst those first few items. So that's a case where you need to understand this customer's shopping history and personalize the search experience to them. There's also all sorts of other things that you need to understand in, in this particular domain uh, in order to not, not throw completely ridiculous stuff in front of the customer. So, you know, uh, bread and breaded are very different concepts. And searching for bread, you don't want to see anything breaded searching, it's showing up in the results. And there's a whole host of those things. Uh, and a lot of that you can actually extract automatically from the data, which is the interesting thing. So you can learn, uh, you know, every time a customer searches, they see a page of 20 or so items. If they scroll down, they can see dozens more. Um, and you can very quickly learn from that which of these items are being actually clicked on and added to the basket. And so that gives you a very tight feedback loop, and you need to integrate that feedback loop into your learning processes um, alongside a segmentation of the different customer types. So you need to learn kind of for everyone, but you also need to learn by specific customer types. Um, and so all of those things kind of come together here. Um, a second example is that of recommendations. Um, and I won't dwell too much on that, but you know, so what I've described in the search area a moment ago, most of the algorithms and things in there for personalizing it are fairly simple. It's a matter of just learning from what you've seen in the past. You know, if, if, I, if when I put this product near the top, no one clicks on it, it needs to go down the search results. Um, and those things are fairly simple. Recommendations can turn out to be quite a lot more complicated because um, it's about sort of correlating the customer's history of what they have bought in the past um, with what similar customers have bought in the past and trying to extract those, those, those few items that you think are going to be uh, are new but are going to be most relevant to this particular customer. And so that is one of the areas where you do need to have your PhD guys focused on doing some good work. Um, but if I look at you know, the recommendations in the search engine, the benefits from personalizing this are you know, 100 to 1 in favor of putting simple work into the search engine to having super clever recommendations. Um, so another very important part of personalization is, and, 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 and bringing the, the action into it is understanding the context of what's going on. 
Um, and there are very, very, very many different contexts in which you, you, you interact with the customer. Um, the best of those, of course, are, are when you have them. Uh, well, the worst of them, of course, is email. Uh, the best of them is when you've got the customer active on your site, uh, here with a cardo or playing your game. And there's many opportunities within that in which you've got a chance to, to personalize and offer spe specific things to them. Um, and uh, these examples here are the various pages that Ocado takes you through when you check out your order. Um, and so that's a specific context. So you've got, a, you've got a context when the customer first signs into the website, and that's probably not the time when you want to be throwing all sorts of stuff in front of them. Um, at least our experience at Ocado was, was that you know, then the customer just wants to get on with their shop, and all the stuff you put in front of them is going to basically be ignored. Um, so that's, a, that's, that's not the right time. Uh, the right time, or an obvious very good right time we discovered is during the checkout process. The customer's done their shop, or feels they've done their shop, um, and they, they, they want to get on with payment and be done. And this is an opportunity when you can do several things. And there's these, the text up there shows you the different kind of algorithms which are running there, almost all of which are actually super simple. So, um, you know, did you forget is simply just the products that you normally buy uh, that you haven't bought today. Um, and that is something that, that almost all of our customers uh, at Ocado really loved because uh, it reminded them of stuff they'd forgotten, basically, um, and was a great service to them. And it was obviously a win-win for the customer in Ocado. Um, and similarly with some of these others, uh, one of the most interesting ones here is actually try something new, the one in the bottom right there. So here, this, is an, this is a place where Ocado would, would put products in front of the customer that uh, they hadn't bought before. Um, and... Um, uh, and uh, it's sort of almost one of the best channels because it's right before you leave the shop um, to, to, uh, to really experiment with different things. And again, you could, you could imagine being super sophisticated about how you decide what products to put there or being very simple. And, and actually, we found that being simple uh, was, was the best. Um, and so there's very simple algorithms behind that, basically looking at what, cust what similar customers have done in the last 24 hours or, or 48 hours. Uh, so you, 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 it's basically a, you know, a randomized process. You know, products go up there, some of them get bought, some of them don't. The ones that get bought get promoted to other customers. The ones that don't get bought get filtered out. And, um, and through that process, we, uh, the system naturally, in this case, deals with seasonality. So you, you know, your strawberries come on season, uh, they will automatically start being shown to customers on Try Something New. Uh, they'll get bought, and other customers will start buying them. Um, and so you, know, you don't have to worry, about, in this particular case, about having super clever algorithms to deal with seasonality and stuff like that. It just happens automatically just through a simple feedback process. Um, so it's really, really important. Now, interestingly, uh, just to sort of change angle for a moment and come back to the importance of understanding the overall customer journey here, um, in fact, the biggest benefit from all of those products that the customer sees there is not on those pages. What we discovered was that the biggest benefit is that those products there, no matter how well designed they were to be exactly what the customer wanted, uh, were actually better at reminding the customer of something else that they wanted, which takes them back into the shop. So if we looked at the revenue from those pages there, um, and compared that with the revenue, which is, was a little bit subtle to calculate, of customers who leave these pages, go back into the shop, buy something else, and then go back into checkout, uh, the revenue from those going back to the shop was actually larger. So that's the importance of, uh, of understanding the full context of the journey. Um, and uh, uh, so that was, um, uh, that was something that was uh, a very great surprise at the time. Uh, and really led us to, to sort of you know, model what we're doing here quite differently. And that, so the, you know, the products here are not just what you want to, uh, what you want to uh, encourage the customer to buy, but they're also things that may trigger them to remember other stuff. And that's great if that's what happens. Let me switch now uh, to the, the second industry, to the games industry of King.com. Um, so here are a few... Um, uh, uh, screenshots of different parts of, uh, of one of uh, King's most popular games, a game called Candy Crush Saga, uh, that's on Facebook and later this month will be rolled out worldwide on, uh, on mobile and tablet. Um, and uh, actually we've learned very, very similar things um, here. So the, the, the big screen at the bottom there, the Yeti shop you can see is, is the store, is one, well, one portion of the store within uh, this particular game. Um, and there's, you know, these, in these games, there's all sorts of virtual goods you can buy. 
Uh, there can be anywhere between sort of five and about 50 different kinds of things you can buy, um, all of which are kind of designed to sort of help in different aspects of the game, uh, but also are fun to use. So, you know, the, it's a really important part of this, this kind of game development is that the stuff that people buy isn't just a kind of add-on that you, that you slap on afterwards, but it's an integral part of the game. Um, and, and that when you buy these things and use them in the game, it's a really kind of fun experience. Uh, and that's sort of an essential part of, of making them something that people will actually enjoy and, and, and can, can you, uh, come back to buy more and more of. Um, and, uh, but here we've got a few different situations. Uh, and this is where, again, coming back to this point of having the right products at the right time and these different contexts. Um, so... Uh, uh, there's a context up the top left there of when, a, when, when the player is about to start the level. Um, and that's the case where you don't really want to get in their way. It's just like logging onto the Okada website, you want to let them just kind of get on with things. Uh, then we've got the shop in the middle there. That's a clear opportunity. They've gone to the shop. Something's triggered them to go to the shop. That's a clear opportunity to get exactly the right product at the right time, which means understanding the, their buying behavior uh, and knowing what you should put there, what special offers you should show them, and all that side of it. And then the one on the top right is, is a very interesting one. So that's, uh, that's an in-game experience. So they've, they've just, uh, the customer there has basically just failed to complete the level. And you give them a last minute opportunity to, uh, to, to buy something which might help them to continue in that level uh, and they might possibly be able to get through it. Um, and so there you, you obviously don't want to you know, be really annoying to have, have all sorts of things in your face at that point, uh, but basically you, you give them at least an opportunity to say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in maybe continuing this level. You know, I was really close to finishing it. I, I feel if I just had a few more you know, moves or minutes, or whatever it may be, I'd get through. And that's something that has been tremendously successful in this game. So again, a, a lot of it is not really about making the shop better here. Uh, it's about getting the right things at just the right time in front of the customer. It's very context specific. Um, so I've talked a bit about customer segmentation uh, amongst all of those last few things. And I, I just like, and I just sort of say it's, it's absolutely essential. And so at Ocado uh, and King, we've segmented the customers in many, many different ways. There isn't a customer segmentation. There's loads of customer segmentations that you need. Um, and so at Ocado, you segment people by, by your sort of recency frequency type stuff of when they shop. But, but clearly in grocery, you know, there's, there's people who are your home chefs who buy a lot of uh, basic ingredients to cook at home. And at the other extreme, there's people who are buying TV dinners. Um, those two types of customers are very, very different, and you need to deal with all of your prediction for those two different types separately. Um, here's a, here's a, a, uh, an example segmentation from King uh, where we're segmenting against uh, the, the um, engagement with the game, the sort of depth of activity um, in the game, and how much they're spending. Um, and there's obviously a big range of customers. In, in none of this will you ever see these perfect, isolated clusters of independent behavior. You know, it just doesn't exist in the real world. Um, uh, but what you do see are different behavioral types. Um, and you've got to draw a kind of arbitrary boundary between them at some point. Uh, and so that's what we've done here with these six different colors. Uh, and actually, the, perhaps the most interesting one to me here was the, the green segment, uh, which are people who, who only play very rarely. You know, we, at King, we think of our best customers as being, the, being these ones who come back every day or every other day, play the game a lot. Maybe it's just on their commute in the morning. That's one kind of customer. Maybe it's a few hours at night and on Facebook in front of their computer at home or, or the tablet on the... Um, um, on, the, uh, on the sofa, um, and we think of those as being great customers, and of course they are. But this green segment, they only play once a month, but actually they spend a reasonable amount every time they play. Um, and, and so that was a surprise to see those customers in here, and it's some, something that we wouldn't have thought of, and well, hadn't thought of before we did this analysis. Um, and you'll see I've got a right-hand column there called action. I haven't filled it in here, but it's just extremely important to understand when you're doing this work what kind of actions you're going to take against these customers. Um, and in some cases, it's obvious. In some cases, it's much less so. Um, but without that, the whole process is kind of pointless. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, um, there's, a, there's a range of ways in which you can drive prediction and segmentation. Uh, you can drive it from, from the customer's own individual behavior, their history, or their very recent behavior. Um, and, and the more real time you can make that under some circumstances can be critical. 
Um, you can also use similar customers, histories or recent behavior, or sort of worst case, you can fall back on kind of everyone's history or recent behavior. And depending on the application and how real time you need to be, different of those can, have been, can be important. Um, and that's, uh, it's, it's hard to draw the right line there. Um, and uh, the last two things, just to sort of bang the drum again, the, the timing and the context of these things is absolutely critical. You can, you can have the greatest recommendation in the world, but if all you're doing is sending an, it out in an email um, a week after the customer's last shopped, it's kind of pointless. Um, and uh, and every, all of these things have just got to be actionable. And so just go back to that churn example. You know, if someone's churned a week or two ago uh, and, you're, and you've predicted that, uh, you've kind of missed the boat. Um, and it's just essential to do these things at the right time and act upon them in the right time through the right channel. Uh, and that's it.